Everybody hear me okay? So I was telling Jabe, if you, after Dave Snowden's talk, if you're looking for something with a little less cognitive load, like this might, this might be it, okay? Um, so it's not, as, it's not as heavy as Dave's, and it's probably not as data-driven as, as Troy's or Larry's was, if you were here for Larry. Um, but what it is, is things that we're doing with customers who are building products, um, and it's making a difference for the, the way they do it. Now, the clients, a lot of the clients we work with, the examples I'm going to use here, are primarily not customers who just have a website offering some sort of software as a service. Um, there are companies who are building uh, aircraft engines. Um, there are companies who are building devices that are going in chemical la uh, scientific labs. Um, and the reason I say that is because I feel like a lot of times um, in this agile and the lean world, those companies get left out, left out of it. There's a lot of people who don't reach across the line to talk about some of the complex problems of integrating software and hardware together and delivering it in a physical channel. And we do that. And um, so I kind of want to share, I guess, a little, with you, a little bit with you about how we are doing that today. First, I want to start with a story. Anybody know what this is? Flying boat. That's pretty close. <clears throat> so um, in the turn of the century, there was a race going on, very similar to the space race uh, of the 60s. And it was for the first manned piloted aircraft. Um, and this is Samuel Langley's attempt at that. Now, Samuel Langley, um, for all intents and purposes, was considered the, the forerunner to accomplish this. He was the guy that everybody, um, if, if you were betting, you would have bet on him. He secured $70,000 from the War Department. He had written a book that was the leading book on aerodynamics. He had successfully piloted uh, multiple uh, non-manned flights. Um, and so for everything that was going on, everybody sort of assumed like that's the guy that's going to solve this problem, right? So unbeknownst to him, two guys that you guys know is probably Orville and Wilbur Wright in Dayton, Ohio, in a small bicycle shop, right? If you've, uh, if you've ever seen what it looked like, a small town, brick building uh, with a big field out back, were working on solving the problem too. Now, these are two guys that didn't have um, a, a college education, they didn't have a high school education, right? And they're attempting to solve this problem that worldwide people are, are struggling with solving and they, for whatever reason, feel like they have the ability, they, they figured out how to uh, tackle this problem and solve it and approach it in a different way, okay? So much so that at the turn of the century, right before uh, the, the, the first flight, um, they sent home a telegram, Wilbur did, to their father and said this, there is no question of final success. Success is assured. Now, this was a year or two before they actually had the first flight, right? And I think this is something that we would all say we would want to be able to say with our projects or products. Um, I know that uh, clients I deal with who are securing funds and doing stuff would love to be able to go to their upper management and say, hey, success is assured. Don't worry about it. I know we haven't built the product yet. I know we haven't launched. But we're here, and what we're going to do, we're going to talk a little bit about how they did this, how they managed this enormous risk involved in uh, manned flight. So this is um, from the S&P 500 or the S&P index. And in 1958, um, the average time a company spent on, on there was 60, sorry, 61 years. All right, anybody guess what it is today? It's, it's a lot less, right? Um, so it's gone down. There's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace. Um, today, it's about 18 years is the average lifespan. Now, what I think also is interesting in this case, from 2011, is just the churn in the market. So here are all the, here are all the companies that left the S&P 500, and here's all the new ones that come in. And if you, I mean, if you look, they're, they're, you know, Quaker, Kodak, Wind, I mean, large companies in, in, in the U.S. that have... Um, that have left the index. And then over here you see things like Amazon, Google, eBay, Netflix. Well, all of these companies are fundamentally taking a different approach to product development than a lot of their predecessors. And it's allowing them to sort of deal with this uncertainty. In this recent uh, report, they looked at 163 companies, small, medium, and large. And the interesting thing about this is they also sort of knew what the companies had estimated prior to 
development um, and, and how they ended up. So they, they had both of them. Um, they found that the respondents manage about $200 million every year, um, of which 37% were at risk. And so on average, they said that, that companies face $74 million of risk at projects each year. That's huge, right? That, that's enormous. There's a, and, and so I, I share that to say there's a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace. Um, and we're at a point where we need to think differently. Um, some other stats here from Forrester, uh, poorly defined applications contribute to 60% failure rate, 50% are rolled back out of production, 40% are found by end users, 25% results of rework, 80% are self-inflicted problems. And anybody else, does this ring true with anybody else they feel in their organizations that this is, uh, at least the organizations that I work with and see, a lot of this is, a lot of this is true. And a lot of this I think fundamentally boils down to not effectively managing risk well or not thinking about risk um, outside of the ex risk of the execution part of risk. So, anybody know, ever heard of this company? Yeah, you're probably from the West Coast. I had not heard of this company, so you guys probably know the story better than I do. Um, and um, so if I say something wrong, jump in and, and help me out. So they were founded in December of 96 and sought out to revolutionize this $450 billion industry of retail grocery. And they had this idea that you're going to go online, you're going to order groceries, and we're going to deliver them to your house the same day. The CEO told Forbes that it was going to, they were going to set the rules for how someone was going to play in this market. Uh, they, were, they were considered the first killer app on the web, or they were going to build the first killer app on the web. Uh, when they uh, were founded, they raised about $10 million. And shortly after that, they raised, and over the next two years, they raised $393 million. So they raised around $400 million to, to launch this. Um, this this product, they had uh, built these large techni technical marvels of warehouses. I'm sure something Amazon would even be proud of today. They spent about $40 million building a single warehouse. They wrote their own routing software, their own investment software, their own um, uh, tracking software for everything. They spent about $18 million on software. Right, so they've they hired uh, CEOs from and VPs from large businesses. Um, they were they were following sort of the the mindset of the time to to grow be as quickly as uh, as they could, be the first to market. When they IPO'd, um, the market cap was around eight hundred and fifty billion dollars for the company, which was higher than the three largest retail grocery chains at the time. Right, so they, I mean. The, the reasons a lot of times we look at and think companies fail in terms of not enough capital. Or, I mean, they, they had those problems licked uh, when they went and set up their first web store. They had 400 employees. In the next six months, they added another 500 employees. So they were growing rapidly, lots of money, lots of interest. And interesting enough, the customers really liked the product. They, the first six months, they had 47,000 new customers. Um, there was a great interest in what they were doing, and people actually reported that they liked the product. Um, 11 months after they IPO'd, they, went, they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. They went bankrupt. Before that, um, they went into deficit or a debt for another 640 some million dollars. So, so total, they were like 1.4 billion dollars uh, in the hole for this, and um, it was a spectacular. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. If you guys crash and burn. I don't, I don't know of any other sort of startup or company that's, that w had raised that amount of money and had that colossal of a collapse, right? And it all sort of ties into this concept that building a successful product is fundamentally about mitigating risk. They um, had a product, they, they, they did a lot of stuff, but it was all based on a lot of uh, guesses and assumptions um, that had not been validated, right? They, 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 they drove spending in, um, based on some market hypothesis. And when they turned out to be false, instead of scaling back the business or funding, right, they secured more money, which is how they got to the $1.4 billion or whatever of, of debt. Um, so if it's, about, if it's about managing risk, let's, let's define risk. And I like this the way Douglas Hubbard sort of defines these. First, he says uncertainty is the lack of certainty, right? It's the existence of more than one possibility. And risk is the state of uncertainty where some possibilities involve loss, catastrophe, or an undesired out outcome. So 
risk is more than one possibility where one of those possibilities could lead to something bad. Right, so what are we gonna do? Launching a product's always gonna involve some amount of risk or uncertainty. There's always gonna be more than one option. There's always gonna be a chance for failure. So we could take sort of this approach from Better Off Dead, right, which I don't know how many people remember this 80s movie, maybe, maybe. All right, a couple people, right? Classic 80s movie. Uh, so the, the, the advice here uh, that, that uh, Charles was given Lane was teaching him how to ski was to go that way really fast if something gets in your way, turn. Right? And unfortunately, a lot of companies operate that web van went screaming fast and um, expected to, to turn, you know, uh, if something got in their way and sort of end up a colossal failure. So let's look at somebody, though, who manages risk as part of their, um, as part of their job or whatever, you know, every, every day. Right. And so this is out of the, uh, the actually out of the, the Marines manual. And they say by its nature, uncertainty invariably involves the estimation and acceptance of risk. Risk is inherent in war and is involved in every mission. And because we can never eliminate it, we have to learn, learn to fight effectively despite it. Right? And I think that's what at least the clients I deal with are struggling with. Uh, we, we recognize the market is uncertain. We recognize there's lots of risk. Um, we have risk registers and risk plans and that kind of stuff, but it still doesn't seem to be protecting us in the same way. Um, how do we learn to fight effectively in this market despite it? Right, and so fundamentally, I think to minimize risk during product development, you need to think and act more like a startup, right? And why do I say that? Because the startup community has been, been evolving and, de and developing disciplined practices for some years now that help us deal with uncertainty um, in, in, these, in these really uh, volatile environments. So let's just look at a little comparison. Um, startup, I think, takes the approach of having a sort of more of a dynamic model versus an existing company follows a rigid plan. The startup is more about learning than execution. They recognize that failure is okay, um, that we're not gonna make perfect decisions. Um, they expect to change direction. Uh, this is an interesting one. The way they, 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 they report metrics or the way they talk about progress is different. They focus on validated learning and experiments as opposed to P&L, cash flow, uh, the balance sheet, schedule performance, earned value. Um, and if you look at the people running the companies or managing those things, they're, they're fundamentally a little different. Executives on the startup side are comfortable with uncertainty and chaos in, in that environment. And over here, it's driving to a conclusion as fast as we can. It's driving to some sort of certainty, even if the decision is wrong. So Jabe talked about that a little bit, if you're in his talk. Uh, people feel more comfortable making a wrong decision instead of living in an, in an environment of uncertainty. And so a lot of times there's a force to a push to make a decision too quickly. So here's a company I don't expect many of you to know. They're in Indianapolis, which we're, we're, we're from. Um, and they're a really interesting company. So Indigo Bio was started by a guy uh, named Randy, who uh, worked at Eli Lilly for many years in sort of the pharmaceutical chemistry company. And um, a very common use of a tool there, my wife's a chemist there, um, is the use of a mass spectrometer. Does that, you may know what that is, all right? So they use a mass spectrometer, and out of a mass spec comes a tremendous amount of data, right? So they have a molecule they wanna look at and break down and pull, pull out all of the unique variations in that and, and, and all this detail and data about that. And they have to review all of this data. And so Indigo had this idea for building a product that basically sucked in all that data, used some models and um, some heuristics to evaluate that and do exception-based analysis. So the only time anybody has to look at the data is through exceptions. And virtually any large company who's using mass specs today use um, their product. They have a beachhead. They started this company. The, they're growing. They have, they have channels um, to lots of different um, to companies. And we recently started working with them. Um, they sort of stepped back and said, we don't want to be a one and done. We don't want to be a, a company that, that builds a great product and that's all we are and then somebody else comes in. We need to innovate, we need to grow and we're not really sure how to do that. We've tried with some things, uh, sort of following our traditional pl plans and they have they've failed. Um, can you help us out? And so we started working with them sort of, to, sort of rethinking this problem, like what, how can we do things differently? So historically they wrote what they called development proposals those development proposals were similar to a business plan that tried to quantify 
the, the risk and the value and the, all of those sort of things. They were taken to the board. The board reviewed those and voted on those. Uh, the, the ones they felt good about were the ones they were given money and funded to. And they, they ran for a long period of time. And then and the, a couple of examples that they, they share with us, um, they all sort of failed, right? So they didn't, they didn't live up to their, to their expectation. And the board is kind of saying, all right, look, this doesn't seem to be working. We need to try something different. Um, what else can we do? And so one of the things we started looking at is sort of this whole planning phase. Like, well, how, do we, how are we even talking about and deciding what it is we're going to work on or um, what we're going to build? So Eric Reese, who's sort of the founder of The Lean Startup, said, says this. We spend a lot of time planning. Uh, we even make contingency plans for what to do if the main plan goes wrong. But if the plan goes right and we still fail, what, what then? Right? And I see a lot of companies like this. There's a fundamental assumption that if I have a plan and we execute the plan, then we're going to be successful. Um, and very few step back and say, again, Webvan, their, 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 their issue was not an execution problem, right? They executed their plan, secured tons of funding, hired people, had capital and everything. Um, it was about, you know, following the plan and the plan was fundamentally wrong. Um, so I love this quote. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? Anytime you use Mike Tyson in a, in a, a presentation, that's always a good thing, right? Um, so I think what we need to do is start thinking about throwing out some of our traditional mindsets towards mitigating risks with perfect plans. Let's acknowledge that we're not going to write a perfect plan, um, and we need to think about it differently. So how many people are familiar with this or have seen this, the business model canvas? Good. Um, so this is something that we're starting to use a lot, and there's a lot of different canvases out there nowadays. Um, there's the Lean Canvas, which I think is more problem solution focused. I have found this for our customers and large enterprises to be good because it sort of acknowledges the fact that you have um, existing channels and partners and resources that you're gonna leverage and use to build new, build new products. And so the way we use this um, depends a little bit on the, on the context. What we wanna do is do a quick pass and sort of Usually I'll, I'll print out a really big one of these and we'll take post-it notes and we'll stick, stick them on. But we want to quickly sort of fill this out, you know, in a hour brainstorming session to kind of um, sort of highlight what we think that, that all these are. I don't know if you can read these. So here, here's the customer segment, who we're solving the problem for. Here's how we reach them and what our relationship is like with them, what the value proposition is or the problem and solution, um, what resources do we need to, to build this? What were the activities in order to, to deliver this? And then what partnerships we need? And at the bottom, sort of this, the cost and revenue. So one way to do this is to take sort of a resource-driven resource approach. So if I have specific resources I'm doing something with, I might start on this side of the canvas and work, work out from there. If I have an idea around a product or solution that I want to test, I might start here and then branch out. Um, if I have a particular customer or market segment that I see is not being served today, or maybe I'm going to resegment a market, so there's an underserved part of an existing market, we may start on this side. Um, here's another way to think about it from a finance perspective, and, and finally sort of maybe multiple epicenter. The point I want to make is that there's a lot of ways to do this, and sometimes I feel like people are really prescriptive. Start here, fill these out in this particular order, and stop. And depending on what you have or where you're starting from, I think it depends a little bit on, on how you approach this or how you, how you fill this out. Um, so here's kind of how what we'll do. The first pass, we'll come up and just define all our hypotheses, all our guesses, like what, what do we think about all, all of these things. And then we'll take another canvas and lay on top of it and say for all those hypotheses, what risks are involved with those guesses we've made to date. And then finally, we'll lay on top of that <clears throat> Um, test. And these tests here are simply past fail test, quick and dirty test to say, how close are we? Because a lot of times those can validate and really help us narrow down where we need to experiment or where we need to look a little more, um, a little more closely. Fundamentally, I think that, that the, one of the things that people struggle with today is sort of market and customer risk, building the wrong thing. Um, I've heard that sort of as a theme throughout the, the conference. And what we're trying to get at here is to recognize that the, that the solution is not often where the greatest risk is in building a new product or launching a new product. Um, oftentimes the risk is in all of the other pieces around it. That's where it fails. And what we want to do is to get all this out. Now, we've taken some of these at times and then used these as inputs to Troy's model to run 
um, statistical analysis to, to look at a run of Monte Carlo simulations to help us create a better model that we can use and then update. But this for me is fundamentally about having a conversation. It's about getting the right people in a room and getting them to acknowledge that, that everything we know about this is, is a guess at this point, right? We may think we know, but until it's in the face of real customers using it or until it's in the market, we don't know. It's a guess, it's a hypothesis. And, in, and from that standpoint, there is obviously some risk to it because we could be wrong. There could be more than one possibility here and some of those could end in, end, end in um, catastrophe. And so we want to highlight those and, talk. and so it so, becomes somewhat of a social aspect to the managing risk. It's about having the conversations and getting people to acknowledge that, yeah, I think this is the case, but there may be more than one possibility. We're going to identify those risks and then we're going to do some really quick and dirty things to help us narrow down on those things that fundamentally we may need to change. Does that make sense? All right. Anybody know who this is? Bonus points for not Louis Pasteur. What was that? Edison. Not Edison. Everybody guesses Edison on this. That's interesting. Uh, this is Alexander Fleming. How about anybody know what Alexander Fleming did? Penicillin, right? So the greatest medicinal breakthrough in um, you know uh, maybe history or whatever for, for it. So the way he, he invented it, and you guys may know the story, but it's pretty interesting to me. Um, he, after World War II, had seen all, you know, the impact of bacteria and stuff and in, in, in impact on wounds and war and was fundamentally looking for sort of this miracle drug that would um, you know, kill a bacteria and, um, and, and, and you know, make this huge, huge impact. Um, he was known for sort of being a little bit sloppy. He wasn't the, 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 the greatest at taking notes and keeping things clean. So he, he, he had been experimenting and had really had not had any success, very, very little success, and um, was going on holiday, and somebody asked him, hey, can I use your lab? And he was, okay, sure, you can use a lab. So he took all his experiments and sort of piled them up and stuck them over in the corner. And um, he came back from holiday, from his two-week vacation, only to find that his experiments had been contaminated and it was basically a complete waste. Right? And so out of frustration, he's taking these things and just throwing them in a lysine bath and kind of cursing and frustrated at the whole experience. Why do I have to share my lab? What do I have to do this? Da, da, da. All this thing that his um, kind of lab partner or whatever comes in. It's like, hey, what's going on? And he's like, oh, there's a huge colossal failure. You know, why do I have to what, you know, share, share lab and um, uh, you, you know, put up with this? And let, let me show you. And so he reaches in and pulls out one of the Petri dishes that, that had not fallen into the lysine bath, and it looked kind of like this. And um, at that point, he kind of stopped and said, well, wait a minute. This is kind of interesting. Were, were the areas where it was contaminated, the, the bacteria is, has uh, been destroyed. Um, he was smart enough to, to stop and say, well, wait a minute. Maybe we need to do a little more investigation around this. Maybe we need to do a little more to understand what's going on and um, sort of then discovered penicillin, right? Uh, now the question I like to ask, or I like to think about, in our organizations today, how many of us would have discovered penicillin? Meaning a lot of the organizations I see are working, people are working on multiple projects. They're under super tight deadlines, really strapped for uh, um, time. And if you made a mistake, do you have the time? Are you going to stop and go tell your boss, oh, man, I made a mistake. Uh, man, I need to start over. All right? Most people are going to take whatever the problem, they're going to shove it under the rug and as, fix it as quickly as possible. Right? I think fundamentally, and this is, I feel like it's a little bit of a problem of Agile. Uh, I could be wrong. But Agile has so, so been so focused on delivery that our focus is all about how much we deliver, how often we deliver, the quantity of deliveries, um, and no one is sort of takes a step back and says, you know, we need to focus on learning. Like, what, what are we learning through the process of, of delivery? What are we, you know, learning from estimates, learning from delivery? Most of us are only focused on the delivery. And if something gets in the way of that, all the metrics and everything we look at tell us that uh, we're just behind schedule. And we, we, need, we need to throw that away and, and, and move on as quickly as possible. So I wonder, and again, how many organizations today we would, we would completely miss this because we, our focus is on delivery and not a focus on learning. 
Um, and <clears throat> Steve Denning and Forbes said this, organizations that figure out what's going on and take advantage of it are going to flourish. Those that don't will become extinct. The future is that thrilling and that grim. And he's talking about this notion of learning um, and, and delivery. So this is Dave from this morning, although uh, he's obviously changed a lot from this picture. <laughs> Good on him, Dave, right? Um, so I'm not going to go as deep as, as uh, he did, but um, this side of the Kinevin framework, which is sort of known for, represents order. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people, we operate over in this space. We think this is where we live, um, which is basically the, the approach is we're going to sense, we're going to analyze the, so we're going we're to do something, we're going to analyze the data, and then we're going to respond to it. And what he would say is this is sort of the complex environment, the, that, um, the complex and adaptive systems he talked about this morning, where we, we have to take a fundamental different approach. Cause and effect aren't known. We need to experiment. We need to try some things. As of trying things, we are, we're, we're going we're to learn. And through that, the, those learnings, then we're going to be able to make, make better decisions, right? So we need to focus on learning through experimentation. This is from my sixth grader. Um, so we, I think we all know how to do experiments, or we were all taught at one point in time, right? So this was out of his textbook, and it's the scientific method. And he says, first, we need to decide on a question to ask, do some research, develop your hypothesis, then plan, execute the experiment, collect data, and draw conclusions. So if you know from the Lean Startup, this is sort of this build, measure, learn cycle we want to do over here. Uh, unfortunately, what I think is left off of the build, measure, learn is this, this piece over here, this sort of framing. What is it we want to learn and why? Uh, so I see a lot of people running experiments, but because they don't take, take a step back and stop and ask what they're trying to learn, um, I think they're missing a huge part of that. All right, so here's this, that build, measure, learn feedback loop that's sort of famous for the Lean Startup. Um, and an experiment is essentially one time around this loop. And learning occurs between what we expect to happen and what actually happens. So hindsight bias says that if I don't say what I think is going to happen and I conduct an experiment, um, and I look at the results, more times than not, I'm going to look at the results and go, yep, that's what I thought would happen, right? And um, th it's a, that's an inhibitor to learning, right? So uh, we need to be disciplined about the framing part. We need to say what we want to learn and why, develop our hypothesis, then see what actually happens, and understand that our learning, what we're going to learn, is going to occur between these two. Uh, so my friend Zach at Rally said, the goal of the feedback loop is to turn assumptions, risks, and unknowns into knowledge. And knowledge is going to guide us effectively through these uncertain environments. And one of the ways we do that, that's sort of famous from the Lean Startups um, community, is this notion of a minimum viable product, right? Which is a product that allows us to collect the maximum amount of validated learning with the least amount of effort. So I see a lot of people struggle with this, this part. I want to learn, I want to conduct an experiment, or I want to deliver a product. Now what should I put into it? And everybody wants to put in the whole kitchen sink, right? Everybody wants to put in m way more than is possible. So a friend of mine, Jeff Patton, had this great uh, test that you guys can walk through to, to, to see if, if you follow this. Like, do, so do you have a problem? Do you have this a problem? And this is from um, an addiction blog, okay? So uh, here we read along here. One, you have the inability to stop or reduce adding new product features. Obsessive or compulsive thinking about new product features. Continues adding new product features despite negative consequences, loss of job, relationships, or opportunities. Increased tolerance, needing more frequent feature additions to experience the same rush. Emotional symptoms of withdrawal when you stop or reduce adding new features. Irritation, restless. Needing to add new product features to improve your mood, escape problems, win back losses. Breaking the law in order to get budget money or recover feature losses. Asking for financial assistance as a result of adding new product features. Denial of feature addition problem or lying to friends or family about your behavior. And finally, frequent mood changes. Right? This, I see this a lot in companies. Uh, I think this is interesting. Replace gambling with adding new product features and I think you see the, the correlation there, right? A lot of us have a problem wanting to add too much stuff, um, and it's difficult to step back from that. And one of the ways I think we do that is through this, this process of learning and experimentation. Um, and our tool for that is going to be these, this is MVP. And there are different types of MVP. This is one of the ways we get to the minimal part. There's different ways to think about it, and I don't have time to go into what all of these are and how they all, all work. 
But there are different types of ways to think about MVP. It could be as simple as a landing page. It could be a video Dropbox. When they launched, um, they launched and has people sign up for beta. They had basically no responses. They made a video, posted it on YouTube, that what, what the product was going to be like. They sort of faked the whole thing. And in a couple of weeks, they had 150,000 like, 150, people or whatever who signed up for, for beta. And they used that then to secure the VC funding. So um, there are a lot of different ways to approach this. Uh, and one of the tools that we use that, that, that has um, starting to become a little bit ingrained in our company and I've used with customers very effectively is this thing. And it um, was developed first by Rally, uh, by Zach Nees, and uh, he called it an Experiment A3, right? And so on this half of the, this A3 is the build, measure, learn, but on this half is the frame. And that's really what I find is the important part. So up here at the top, it, it asks you, what do you want to learn and why? So what's your, what's your assumption? What's your risk? How do you, what are you going to do? And then how are you going to, what's your hypothesis to test? And the, the hypo, hypothesis needs to be falsifiable. So we typically write it, if I do this, then this will happen, right? Um, and then what are, the, what are the materials or methods we're going to use to run the experiment? Here we might describe the type of MVP we're going to use or how we're going to approach that. Uh, and then this is interesting, safety. So when a large enterprise organization oftentimes running the experiment is using um, maybe production code or resources, how am I going to roll that back? How, I'm gonna, how am I going to make sure that we don't break something that's already in existence? And then given, given what you learned, what's, what, you know, what, what's next, right? Okay, so then um, the results, what we learned, uh, what you should explore, uh, and then sort of our outcomes. And then what we do is <clears throat> create sort of a Kanban board that helps us sort of track and monitor these, these experiments. And we use this a way to sort of track and report metrics different than the traditional metrics. So uh, if you think about it, Kanban is a system that helps improve efficiency and flow. Um, and the things I'm pushing through Kanban, typically stories or features, um, you know, it's all about improving the, the efficiency and flow of delivery, um, but if I change it, if I change the ticket, if what I'm pushing through here is an experiment, and the experiment represents an opportunity to learn, then the Kanban system becomes a tool for me to optimize my efficiency around learning, my cycle time around learning. How quickly are we learning? How much are we learning? How fast? What experiments have we run? Which are, what's the results of those? Which were validated or invalidated? Um, and so for us, the, the Kanban and Lean, this to me where, those, where the Lean part of the Lean startup kind of comes in, um, is really about helping us run and execute and become very effective at learning, moving from that mindset of a focus on delivery to one that's focused on learning. And as we're building the experiment, we're working to build out parts of the product to do our test. That's part of what the MVP is. And so it sort of all, all kind of works together. Right, so sort of in conclusion, uh, let's go back to the Langley and the Wright brothers, who minimize risk better? So Langley took, he, he spent about 17 years, and the Wright brothers, a little more than 22 months. Langley spent $70,000 in today's dollars, about 1.8 million. The Wright brothers spent around a thousand bucks. Today's dollars, about 26K, right? Langley had the design, build, test, repeat model. And the Wright brothers took the different approach. They did this sort of test and experiment. Um, they, they broke it up into several different problems. There was uh, lift, control, propulsion, um, and they decided to tackle each one of those with small experiments. They built, effectively, they built a small wind tunnel in their bicycle shop and um, tested these. When they had solved one, they went to the next problem. They, so before they ever built the plane, that's when they sent the telegram home to say, success is assured. They sort of already knew. They had already answered the problems. They had conducted the experiments. They had learned what they needed to learn. Now it was just a matter of execution. All right. Thank you. Uh, questions? Forty minutes goes by way way quick to try to cover. Oh. Question? Yeah. So um, that was the A3 model you got there, right? Mm -hmm. So the model, it seems like there is a lot of A3 is kind of almost sort of agile in the sense that there's a lot of weight that has to come from the There's a lot of weight that you have to get yep. through. So there's a lot of issues. So there's a lighter version of that that's sort of more effective, or is it a matter of really kind of get, you get put into the kind of system? 
Um, I prefer people to fill out most of it just from the standpoint of I want them to capture what they want to learn and why. If, my, my experience is if they don't do that and they don't stop to think about that, right, that this over here starts to not matter. Because what, whatever that comes out, whatever the ancillary insights are or the next steps or whether it's validated, it's almost always validated. Um, so I, I don't think you have to spend, you know, days writing this. I think it could be a really quick thing. But what I want people to do is at least stop and ask the question, what do I want to learn and why? And then let's think about how do I, how do I you know, run an experiment? So <clears throat> for us, a lot of times we, we, when we would story map or do anything, uh, we would identify risk stories, right? Basically things that we were uncertain about, things we don't know. And for every one of those risk stories or items that we would push to the Kanban board, we would run an experiment around. And for every one of those risk items, I want people to identify what, is they, what are they fundamentally wanting to learn around this particular item. So that, that to me is the, the easy part. I think you can do a shortened version of this to, to, to your point, right? Um, if, you, if you want to drop a card, I usually, we have, usually have the slides up. Um, if you want to drop a card, I'll give you the slides and the, all the forms in here um, you guys can have or whatever. Uh, so if you have a card and just, um, there's a bowl up here, you can throw it in, I guess. Um, I'll make sure you get copies of the slides and, uh, and, and yeah, this is out there. Anybody else question? Thanks.